Welcome, E4 Family Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us. You've waited long enough and it's just around the corner. Sunday, July 3rd at 11 a.m. is our next in-person service at Lakeridge High School. Don't miss out on this opportunity to join together and taking communion, fellowshipping one with another, enjoying food, and a word from God and having some fun along the way. If you're unable to attend, join us at our online service at 10 a.m. Today concludes our Kingdom Living series. It has been a good one. And today we are talking about Kingdom Anchored. We are learning from Philippians 4, how to anchor ourselves. If you missed any part of this series, join us on our website at our On Demand section or on our YouTube channel. E4 Kids, your worship service starts right now at e4familychurch.com. Parents, don't forget the parent guide that will assist you with today's lesson. I invite you to worship the Lord through your giving at e4familychurch.com. And I wanna thank you to all those who have given and continue to give. Well, it's time to pray. Join me in lifting up our prayers to the Lord. God, we are so thankful and we're so grateful that we can bring our prayer requests to you, that we can bring our concerns to you, that you will meet us where we are and you would meet our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So God, we thank you that we have your word to go to when we need wisdom and guidance, that we have your Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of us to guide and direct us and to speak to us. God, so we're thankful for it. Lord, today we pray for our minds, God, and we pray for those who may be anxious, maybe we're worried or anxious about something. God, let us do what your word tells us in Philippians 4, to be anxious for nothing but instead to pray about things, to bring things to you in prayer, to thank you for what you've already done. And God, we pray that that peace that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God, may we live in your peace. May we walk in your peace. May we be at peace in Jesus name. Amen. Let's worship. I want to welcome you guys to worship with us, me and my friends. Mm -hmm. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. You have held me in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Come on, sing with me And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God I love your voice for you have led me through the fire and in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father and I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and All my life you have been faithful and All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing the goodness of God. Can we sing it again? And all my life you have been faithful. 
faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me Come on, sing it with me Your goodness is running after It's running after me oh. Your goodness is running after It's running after me with my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life Hello and welcome to the family. I'm Pastor Jason and I'm excited about today's message. We're going to be wrapping up our series on kingdom living. Uh, what we've been walking through is this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi over 2,000 years ago. The instructions in there are powerful and they are timeless. Uh, they are kingdom principles on how to live in God's kingdom. Uh, today, specifically, what we're going to be focusing on is being kingdom anchored. And I, I want to just share this thought with you before we get into the Word of God. Uh, I've enjoyed reading through this chapter series with my, my son, John. John is my second born. I'm telling you, if you want to play a game of chess or checkers, get prepared to lose. This boy knows what you're going to do before you do it, right? I mean, I'm his dad, but, but playing checkers or chess with him, I have to play him like I'm playing a grown man. I mean, he is that good. And so it's fun reading a chapter series with him because he hasn't read it yet. Six books in the series, and I've read all seven books, and, and I know the beginning from the end. I know it very well. Uh, some of the books have movies that have been made uh, with it, and, and I've read about commentary from the author, and I know why he wrote it, and when he wrote it, and, and I'm a historian, so it's fun. I have a, an advantage over him, and so he'll come to me in the middle of the book and, and say, Dad, oh, what's going to happen? And, and he's nervous because of the heroes and what, what might happen, and, and is the bad guy going to win? And I just smile. I'm completely anchored because I already know uh, what's going to happen to the hero in, in book one, book two, book seven, all the way through. Uh, I've been doing this with my children. I did it with Jacob. He's 15 now. And, and it's fun when he and I sit and with John and, and John, who's 12, he sits there with us and he, he shares and he speculates about what he thinks going to happen. And sometimes he's right. Sometimes he's not. But he's not anchored in his decision or his thought process. But what I want to talk to you today about is being anchored in our faith. You see, God loves us so much that he wrote a book for us. And this book is his word. And from Genesis to Revelation, there are full of promises for us, ways on how to live now in preparation for, for the kingdom that's coming, right? But I'm anchored in my faith because I've read the book. I know the beginning and the end. And I know the author. I know him personally. He is my God. He is my king. He is my Lord. And so today, what I want us to focus on as we're reading through this is how we too can be kingdom anchored. There are some instructions that Paul is giving the church at Philippi that are timeless. Uh, ultimately, what Paul is providing for us is a perfect plan for imperfect people, that this is not Paul's plan. This is God's plan that he gave to man. 
knowing that because we're imperfect, we need a perfect plan to save us. And God is the one who actually planned it all out. And he did it and executed it perfectly. And so as we head into today's message, I know full well that there's a lot that rocks our boat, that we can be anchored in him. And you allow the words that I'm going to share today to comfort you, to guide you and to lead you and to give you peace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you desire that none of us would be rocked to and fro, but that we would be anchored anchored in our faith, anchored in what we believe, anchored in the one who left heaven and came to earth to purchase us with his own blood, anchored in the one who is now seated at the right hand of the Father, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And so just catching you up real quick, we begin with understanding that our God is not just a creator of all things, but he is king. Uh, what we talked about in chapter one is that in his kingdom, there's a new way of acting and feeling. It's a, it's a new way of understanding. And it begins with a kingdom heart that God gives us himself, that we surrender our heart to him. And in return, we receive the very heart of God. And so our heart beats for the same things that his heart beats for. It's just like Jesus when he walked this earth and says, I don't do anything except that which my father says do. I don't say anything except that which my father says say. I speak as one who is representing the kingdom. Well, friends, now that we have given our heart to the Lord, that we belong to him, the same is true for us. And in doing so, we now have a kingdom perspective that when we enter the scene, we enter not as just a, an ordinary person, but as a citizen of heaven, that the perspective of what's happening changes when we walk in. We can pray and talk to the living God and invite him into the circumstance. We see now that even chains themselves can be used for the glory of God's kingdom and help embolden the church to do even greater work. So powerful. And then the last thing in chapter one that we focused on was kingdom standards, that we now have a new way of living, that it's not my standard or the world standard. Doesn't matter what laws are on the books or not. The, the laws that I'm most concerned with now are the laws of God. And listen, under the old covenant, it was all about what you did on the outward. But under the new covenant, it's all about the work of the heart. So powerful. Uh, in Philippians chapter two, we talked about oneness in God's kingdom. So much talk about unity in our world. But friends, apart from God, there is no unity because we're born selfish, that we each want our own desire. So kingdom unity begins with us having kingdom humility. And that allows us in turn to live kingdom brightly, that it's not about my will. It's about his will, that Jesus himself, though being fully God, didn't consider his deity to be something to be grappled with when he walked this earth, but instead humbled himself onto the point of even death. And now listen, what happened with him? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Friends, God now wants us to follow suit, that even in our suffering, we understand that there's humility that it produces a kingdom and an eternal reward. And ultimately that led us to Philippians 3, kingdom goals, that we need to keep our mind focused on him and remembering why we are doing this, that this life is temporary, that there's an eternity that is at hand, that he placed that in our hearts. And we can live this life walking with kingdom confidence, not based on what I have done. It's not Jesus plus something else, not based on my past or my present, but based on Christ, that I have confidence in the work of the cross and confidence in knowing that Jesus didn't stay dead, but he is seated now at the right hand hand of the Father. I have confidence knowing that he says, I go to prepare a place for you that I hasn't seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man what he has prepared for us. And that leads us to kingdom perseverance, forgetting the past, pressing on so that we ultimately can receive kingdom rewards. And kingdom rewards, friends, are not temporary, are not of this world, but they are eternal. And that leads us to today's focus, being kingdom anchored. Well, friends, being kingdom anchored with all that is going on, it begins with kingdom joy and kingdom joy goes beyond what we see with our natural eyes, beyond what we hear with our human ears. But it actually is a place that resides deep within our soul, deep within our very spirit, because now our citizenship is in heaven and we know that our king has conquered and we rejoice in him. And that's the first thing we do. We rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul says this to the church at Philippi. A, a battle was taking place among 
fellow believers and sisters that loved each other and started this race well. And Paul is appealing to them and he speaks to them. And he goes, guys, what are y'all doing? Why are y'all fighting? Y'all are sisters. Y'all are, are part of the family. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Put your little agenda down and come together. Take time now and rejoice in the Lord. It's not about are you right or is she right? Listen, if we put ourselves in the right context, listen, we'll be right when we're right with God. Outside of that, nothing really matters. And he tells them, your circumstance doesn't define your joy, but God does. He says this in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. He's saying this dispute that y'all have is foolishness. Instead, I want you to know you're conducting yourself in a manner that lets the world know that God is here, right here. Because though God, Jesus, is seated at the right hand of the Father, the gift that was promised to us, those who belong to the body, those who belong to him, is that we now become the temple of the living God. His Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. He is at hand. So I am conducting myself with, with an attitude of letting the world know that he is here. But I'm also conducting myself, letting the world know that I have a new kingdom perspective and I'm rejoicing not in my circumstance. Yeah, that news I received is awful. But the first thing I'm going to do is rejoice. I'm going to praise God because I know irregardless of what happens to this physical body, this body is temporary and I can look forward to what's to come. The irregardless of what's going on on this world, the problems here are temporary. But friends, even though that's true, God still wants to get involved. And that's the second thing that we do to receive kingdom joy. And that's to request help from God. You know, I love when my kids, they'll come to me and, and they'll share kind of their day and what's going on. And they're celebrating, you know, coming off of Father's Day was great. And I got to hear so many wonderful things from my kids. It was a wonderful time celebrating with them. Got to spend some time with my own dad and celebrate him. But here's what's wonderful for me as a dad. It's when my kids ask for help. It's amazing. It's, it's like, wow, do you have a problem? and I have the ability to help solve it. That you, you have a concern, you have a, a, a situation that you don't know how to deal with it, but I can get involved. And Paul says, this is the way we need to come to our God. This is the way we need to come to our King. This is the way we need to come to Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Friends, this is what we do. When we come to our Heavenly Father and we cry out to Him, because guess what? If I could solve this problem on my own, I would, but I can't. And I'm just like my kids, throwing up my hands. But I do so knowing that, that my Heavenly Father cares deeply about me. And I watch as the countenance of my kids' face change when they invite me into the midst of their problem. And I get up and I begin to move. And guess what they receive immediately? Problem is still there. But because I leaned in and I'm trying to help them, my kids, my kids receive peace. And so much more, Paul says, I want you to receive peace from the Lord, right? My kids receive peace when they see me get up and I'm moving on their behalf. Even more so when we rejoice in the Lord, not in our circumstance, but in him. That when we take our eyes off of this problem, we focus on him and, and how big he is and his majesty and his glory and how wonderful he is. And the fact that I am his son and he loves me. And he cares about me and I can ask for help. And then I receive peace because I begin to see God move. And, and I love what it says in Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want you to understand whose peace this is. This is not the peace of man. This is not the peace that comes from your bank account or from just feeling good today, being high today, low tomorrow. No, this is God's peace. This peace, the peace of God. This is his peace that one of the names that Jesus has is Shalom, Prince of Peace. And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The reason why we receive peace is because, friends, just like I move on behalf of my kids, because I love them, I care for them, I want to help them. God loves us. He cares for us. And he wants to help us that the moment we invite him in to our circumstance, to our problem, we hand it over to him. Peace begins to come because we've handed it over to him. And when God solves a problem, he does it perfectly. Now, it doesn't mean that in that moment he's going to solve it the way that you want it solved. But it does mean that he's going to take care of it the way that it needs to be taken care of. Now, along this journey, Paul is also saying you want to be kingdom anchored. You need to be kingdom anchored. And another way to be kingdom anchored is to walk with kingdom wisdom, that there's another way of thinking that goes beyond this world's way of thinking. He says, what I want you to do is to ruminate on the right things. And many of us are familiar with ruminating. It's the the process of thinking about something over and over and over and over and over. And Paul says, listen, that's a gift from God. Thinking about something over and over again is great if it's the right thing. But man, if you're thinking about the wrong things over and over and over, it destroys relationships. It destroys life. It destroys us. We are not meant to think about the wrong kinds of things. And he goes on to give us a list of what to think about. I I love this list. I live by this list. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This is so powerful. I remember, you know, studying about the presidents and and one president in particular, he's a hero of mine. Uh, the, the legend has it that that while the country was at its at, at its worst, like there was this potential between the north and the south, you know, dividing and becoming two nations. And and man, it was really, really hard uh, for my hero. I read about him. So grateful for him. Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe and and and, and one of the, the legends that I've read about him. Right. And I say that because, you know, when you read about historical figures, you know, it can be tough to get all the the facts and the details. But this one I thought was really powerful. It's like along the way, he learned how to ruminate on the right things. And and according to legend, it says that, that there was a moment in time when the country loved him and the papers said wonderful, like great things about him, blowing reports about him, that honest Abe and man, it was great. And so what he did was he clipped that article out and he put it in his pocket. And then when things started getting real tough and and people were concerned about the state of, of the union and what was going to happen in our country, that the news media wasn't so kind and the reports weren't as generous and they would come to him and say, you know, president, Mr. President, do you see about what they, they read? Have you heard about what they're saying about you? And he would look at them with a big smile on his face and he would reach in his pocket and he would pull that, that report out, the one that was glowing, that was wonderful, the one that said, you're the right man for the job. And he would read that to himself. And he'd say, yeah, I read that report. And he put it back in his pocket. You see, he understood on how to ruminate on the right things. Instead of reading the report that is wrong and negative and the hurtful and hateful things that this world has to say about us, instead, what he chose to do was to ruminate on things that are true, things that are noble, things that are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are of good report, and things of virtue, and things that are praiseworthy. Friends, if we meditate on the opposite of these things, it produces things like ulcers. It produces division in relationship. It it prevents us from unifying because we're focusing on the wrong things. And then Paul says, listen, in addition to ruminating on the right things, 
kingdom wisdom, being anchored in the body, being anchored in God's word means that you're going to also imitate Christ. That it's not enough to be a hearer of God's word and to think about all of these things that are of good report, but you also need to take a step further and actually imitate the things that you've learned. He says it this way in verse nine, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. He says, you want God's peace, then live the way that God did. You want the peace of, of Christ to come upon you, then live the way that Jesus did, that Jesus lived at peace with God the Father and in turn receive peace because he was at peace and he is peace. And he says, and imitate him. Paul says it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. Friends, that's a litmus test for us all. You don't just follow a person just because you're watching. Are they imitating Christ? Are they living in the same way, in the same manner that Jesus did? You follow the leader as that leader follows Christ. And if they go off course, then you keep following Christ. You keep imitating him because Christ is all about the will of the Father. And Christ is all about making sure that your end is with him. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. But the third thing with kingdom wisdom being anchored in our faith is when we participate in the solution. When we imitate Christ and we do what he does, it allows us to then participate in the solution that God himself is responding to our request when we've prayed to him. And then he is moving on our behalf and he's going to tell you some things he wants you to do. Paul says it this way, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly and that now and at last you, your care for me has been flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lack the opportunity. He is saying, you're understanding my situation. I want to help you understand what's happening here. So he's walking them through kingdom wisdom. And, and he tells us that kingdom wisdom is ruminating on the right things, thinking about things that are pure, lovely, and admirable. He tells us that, that kingdom wisdom is, is imitating Christ. Do what Jesus did. This is why it's important for you to know what he did so that you can follow his example. But then he also says, participate in the solution. That many of us live in a world that's broken, our communities, where we are. And you can spend a lot of time praying and God's responding and you'll receive peace. But then there's a moment in time when you need to act, when God is calling you to be a part of the solution. And in this moment right now, Paul was was, was the kind of apostle that was self-sufficient. You would never see Paul go into any church service and take up an offering for himself on his own, own accord. That wasn't how he flowed. In fact, Paul was a businessman on the side and he was a tent maker. When he would travel from one church to the next and establishing this church, he made sure that he would sell enough tents so that he had enough money to take care of his own needs so that he wouldn't be a burden on the new church that he was helping to establish. And that worked for him. But then there came a moment in time where he was thrown in prison. Can't sell any tents. And then instead of just being in a normal Roman guard, they had him under house arrest. Well, it's nice you're in the house, but you still got to pay your bills and you still got to take care of yourself and he can't leave. And so what he is saying to them is that you all, you are participating in the solution that I have needs that I've talked to God about them and you all are responding to my need. He says it this way, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again that you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. They were thinking, oh man, Paul's been arrested. What are we gonna do? How do we help? Oh, we know he's gonna need some money. We know he's gonna need food. He's gonna need care. He, he says to them, you lack the opportunity. But then he, he explains a big kingdom principle that we need to grab a hold of. This, this will anchor us in this time. And he, he says, listen, walk in kingdom stewardship. That the possessions that you have belong to the king. They don't belong to you. They belong to God. And when God 
invites you to participate in the solution, you're doing so with resources that belong to the king. They're not our resources. They belong to him. And, and he tells them, this is a very important lesson. And I'm going to read some passages that you heard before, but we're going to put it in the right context. He says, kingdom stewardship, friend, starts with you and I being content. Being content, that's not complacent. Don't confuse the two, but it's being content. And he says it this way in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, that state I am to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I know a lot of you have quoted that. I've seen that tattooed. I remember this boxer getting it on his forehead and I can do all things right before he got knocked out. It's like, what? Come on now. That's not what that passage is talking about. What that passage is saying to us is being content and being a good steward. He is saying, when I've been in circumstances selling lots of tents and having plenty of money, I, I knew how to live in my, within my means. But I also understood that, hey, you know what? I'm in this, this situation. I'm in prison now for my faith, and, and I know how to live within my means. I, I know how to live with God has supplied me in this moment. I know how to be content. So that's the first thing, that kingdom stewardship is all about being content. Being anchored in God means being content in him and with whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, in that moment. It doesn't mean that we don't get up and go get a job and try to work. I mean, again, Paul, when he had the means and the ability, he sold tents. And at this moment, he, he doesn't, he's, he's chained, but he's learned to be content. But then he says, Kingdom stewardship also is about being generous. Again, as I said, all that I have doesn't belong to me, but it belongs to the king. It belongs to him, that my resources are his resources. And I have just been put in charge to be a steward of those resources. And Philippians 4, 14 says it this way. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. The fact that you care that I'm in this plight, in this situation with these chains is a good thing. That you are concerned about me is a good thing. God sees your concern and God's going to reward even the very heart that you have regarding me. That when you see a situation that is not good and you decide to pray, God is pleased with your heart. He's pleased with your attitude. He's pleased with your appeal to him. But he goes on in verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. He's saying, I've not asked anybody to give, but you all decided to give. That when I was over here and, and ministering and, and, and departed from Macedonia, you all decided to help fund this ministry. And then he says, even more so in verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. He says, you understood my situation, my circumstance. And one of the big things that Paul needed, perhaps even more so than, than the financial need, was company. That, yeah, he had a Roman guard with him, but he also had a friend in the faith. Epaphroditus went there and he ministered to the needs of Paul. He kept company with him. He cared for Epaphroditus. He was there to help share in the burden, going grocery shopping and making sure the house was properly clean. Can't do a whole lot of cleaning when, when your hands are chained. And, and if you've ever been to the Middle East, it can get quite dusty. And so Epaphroditus is there, sent as a gift to help serve Paul in his time of need. They were generous 
And they thought, let us send someone to help and let us send a financial gift as well. And Paul said, in doing so, your generosity wasn't just received by me, but it's a sweet aroma to God himself. That being generous is not about the person who we're doing it for, but it's ultimately about God in heaven that there are people praying prayers right now in desperate need and God's tapping us on the shoulder saying, I want you to meet that need. I want you to be a part of the solution. And then the last thing that Paul tells us that kingdom wisdom means being at peace, being at peace, that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding comes on us when we pray, but this is also a state of being and how we live. Philippians 4.19, he says, And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He is saying, be at peace because you are ministering on behalf of the kingdom, that you've been trusted with these resources and you have chosen with your resources to be content, that you have your own need, yet you have decided to be generous to help me. And in doing so, I want you to know that God sees and you can be at peace because just like I'm in need and you have chosen to be a part of the solution, that when you pray and you talk to God, God sees your need and he's going to meet your need according to his riches and according to his glory. Be at peace because you're in Christ. Be at peace. And in essence, friends, what he is saying to us is be anchored in your faith. Be anchored in the one who died for you and the one who loves you and the one who cares for you. He, he's saying this is the way to live. And so for us today, I want to ask you, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? That as we go through chapter one, two, three, and four, I, I truly believe that our call to action today is to say yes to God's perfect plan for imperfect people, to say yes to the king, to say yes to his lordship, to bow the knee now and to choose to do things his way, to say yes to oneness in God's kingdom, that it is not about my kingdom or our kingdom, but it is about his kingdom. To say yes to kingdom goals, that God's desire is for his church and for his bride to be as big and beautiful as possible, that God desires that none would be lost. Friends, what God wants us to do is to say yes to being kingdom anchored because we keep our eyes focused and settled on him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you, God, for those that are listening to today's message. Father, I thank you for those that have been on this journey. I thank you, Lord, even in the midst of being rocked and tossed to and fro, that we come right back to the only one that we can place our confidence, that it is not based on what I have done or haven't done, but it is completely and totally based on what Jesus has done, that we are anchored in our faith because our God is immovable. That Father, just like I am anchored in knowing what's gonna happen in the story because I've read the beginning and the end, I am grateful, God, that we too as your sons and daughters can be anchored in our faith because we have read the book and we know that Father, there's a day in in the near future, where you're coming back, not riding a donkey, but a horse, a day that you're coming back to claim us all, to be with you forevermore. So Father, I pray that that would anchor our souls and our minds and whatever we're going through, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, I also wanna pray for those that need to take a next step. You need to know God. You need to hear God. You're struggling and trusting him and following him. And if that's you, I want you to text the word hello to 833-750-1352 or fill out a connection card. And we're going to follow up with you and help you take your next step. God bless you. Love you. And can't wait to connect with y'all. If you're going to be in the DFW area next week, come and hang out with us. Our next in-person service is July 3rd. Uh, you can also hang out with us online at 10 a.m. as always. God bless and can't wait to see y'all next week.